and Country, a program of ideas for the home, yard, and farm presented by the Institute of Agriculture and featuring Associate Professor Ray Wolf, Extension Information Specialist. Now, here's Ray. Collective bargaining is a term much discussed these days in agricultural circles. It's considered, too, a relatively new thing. In order to find out more about it and uh, just why it is of so much concern, I've asked George Donahue, Professor of Sociology at the University, to discuss this topic. So, George, first, what essentially is collective bargaining and uh, just where and how is it used in our society? Ray, collective bargaining. The first thing about collective bargaining is that many people think of the word collective immediately. And somehow or another, the word collective in our society has gained sort of a negative meaning to a lot of people because we associate it with something other than a so-called free democratic society. Not realizing, of course, that many of the behaviors in American society or any society, as a matter of fact, society itself is a form of collective behavior. And collective bargaining to rural people, particularly farm people, also has another uh, connotation because they usually associate collective bargaining with unionism. And I think if we're to be honest with ourselves and if uh, we're to be rather forthright about it, we would say that uh, rural people generally have been anti-union rather than pro-union in our society. Now, collective bargaining itself means joining together on a part of a number of people to make a concerted effort to get their point of view across, to develop mechanisms, both social, economic, and political, which will bring forth a greater achievement of their goals, what they want, what they desire, what they'd like to have. So it means joining together on the part of a number of people in an interest group so that they can put forth their point of view with as much power, with as much strength as they can muster collectively rather than individually. Good, good. Now, what uh, recent events would you say, George, contribute to its current popularity? Well, I would say that as far as the current popularity among rural people is concerned, it's undoubtedly associated with the development of the National Farmers Organization, which has as its main thrust, you might say, the idea of collective bargaining, of joining together farm operators so that they will have control of their product and in that fashion have some determination of the price structure in agriculture. People will say, of course, agricultural bargaining or collective bargaining existed in agriculture long before uh, the existence of the National Farmers Organization. True as that is, through the medium of uh, agricultural cooperatives, both production cooperatives and servicing cooperatives and distribution cooperatives of various types, the fact remains that it has become more or less an acceptable term and even a feasible process, that is, collective bargaining has become feasible because of the efforts and organization and education and development of the NFO since about 1955, particularly in the Midwestern states. So I would say that that is uh, one of the recent events that has given considerable impetus to it. There are some other events. There are some social trends which are occurring. For instance, the depopulation of rural areas, the increasing uh, demands made upon rural people for educational and other facilities in the light of a decreasing population have made people in rural areas consider very seriously what they may do uh, in order to increase their bargaining power. The rather general low level of return to farmers for their investment over the past decade and the expectation of a low rate of return over the next 10 years has also made them think twice about how our economy happens to be structured and what is their role in our, our economy relative to other vested interest groups in our economy. Those are but a few of the things uh, that have been recent events, both in terms of economic, social trends, in terms of organizational developments, that have given rise to a good deal of discussion, a good deal of concern about collective bargaining and its possibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, what would you say are some of the factors or some things that are considered to be factors that, that might inhibit uh, collective bargaining or the, the working for the, the good of all? I'm thinking maybe now, agriculturally speaking, number of farms and diversity of farming and how that might fit into the picture. This is often uh, one of the arguments uh, given by 
let's say, um, well, let's put it frankly, again, uh, um, given by the individuals in agriculture who are anti-collective bargaining. They say there are so many farmers in the economy, for instance, over three and a half million. How can you organize three and a half million people into any type of concerted effort through a organizational structure which tends to be rather abstract? They say uh, if there were a hundred people or there were three uh, automobile manufacturers or half a dozen steel manufacturers, such may be a possibility, but not with three and a half million independent producers. Well, we ought to take a look at that, Ray. Uh, look at unionism. We have in the labor force in excess of 70 million people now. And not over 20 million of those people, or possibly 25 if you included all types of union organization, 20 to 25 million would be organized into unions, which are collectively bargained. And of course, unions more or less collectively bargain on the basis of national and state legislation, such as the National Labor Relations Act, or the, what is commonly called the Wagner Act, which permitted collective bargaining and legitimized it, so to speak, in our society, made it an acceptable thing for labor. But this anti-attitude of farmers and rural people towards unionism more or less uh, results in their blocking mentally to the acceptance of the concept or the idea of collective bargaining. You see, because one thing they have in their mind about unionism is that it's alien to the so-called rugged individualism, the free enterprise system, which uh, they have in mind, their concept of it. And they uh, have not fully uh, appreciated the changes in our industrialized economy and the interdependence of our economy. Therefore, there's still this block mentally on the part of rural people of accepting collective bargaining. See, they do not associate collective bargaining as it occurs in cooperatives where producers band together to market their product or to buy input services for their uh, production units. They do not uh, see this as a form of collective bargaining which is in, a, in any way similar to collective bargain, bargaining as practiced by unions. Therefore, I think one of the big difficulties is the mental block and the a sort of a rationalization for this mental block and is the numbers, the number of units that exist, they say, with this many units you can't organize them. Well, the organization of labor sort of puts this argument, uh, let's say, in question at the very least, whether or not you can organize that many people, that many people have been organized. You mentioned another point about diversity. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I think there's a lot of diversity. There are soybean farmers, there are dairy farmers, and they may be in competition with one another. The soybean farmer provides the basic product from which the oil is developed for oleomargarine, whereas a dairy farmer provides butter fat which goes into butter. Now they may compete and be substitutable products. And people say, well, when you have that much competition among producers, it's virtually impossible to get them together. This is not necessarily true. They can have common goals as a sector of the economy, uh, which they will band together around uh, or, and have, uh, let's say, competition within the group uh, for the market available for these two products. Uh, this is very frequently done by labor. For instance, labor is, uh, much labor is substitutable for other labor. And as a matter of fact, labor has a great competitor in the form of capital equipment, which can, can and has been substituted for labor over the years. So I would say that uh, there is some question about whether or not diversity uh, can stop organization. The best illustration of this, I think, is the CIO. Uh, which has vertical organization, where the janitor in the plant is organized along with the engineer in the plant. Now, these people certainly have quite diverse interests, quite diverse skills, quite diverse roles in the plant, yet they can organize to bargain collectively with management for their particular share of the rewards of production. So diversity, while it may be a limiting factor, just as numbers may be a limiting factor, they in no way prohibit uh, entirely the development of a collective bargaining unit. <clears throat> what effect do you think the perishability of products have on collective bargaining? For example, let's take wheat, maybe your soybeans versus a fruit that uh, can't keep. Mm -hmm. A very effective argument because it appeals to, I think, a, um, again, a uh, notion, a value, an attitude which is present in the farm population. For instance, how many times when you were a young person, when you were sitting at a table and you were reading and you 
couldn't finish it and you wanted to leave the table, did your mother or father say to you, don't waste that food, you must sit there and eat it? Often. Often. Well, why do we say that? I mean, if you've satiated your hunger, why do we say eat it? I know I found myself doing that to my children and uh, I've wondered sometimes uh, whether or not I'm correct in doing this. Maybe they're overeating, you know, we're worried about overeating today. But there's this negative value towards waste, you see. Therefore, people believe that uh, you can't waste product once it is created. Particularly, let's say, plow under a crop or, uh, let's say, dump milk and so forth because this is sinful to waste this. Well, the empirical facts are quite contrary to it. In New York in the 30s, they had a milk strike, and they did dump milk. They dumped milk by the millions of gallons there. We have plowed under crops, and we have let butter go rancid in storage, and we have, in a sense, wasted many crops in an effort to maintain a price level or to agree on a price level. I think the real question comes in such things as taking the life of livestock for other than slaughtering purposes for eating. Who's going to go out and shoot livestock, you may ask? We don't mind shooting deer. We don't mind, let's say, knocking the livestock in the head when they're in the uh, pens. Uh, but to go out and shoot them and uh, not utilize them seems very wasteful. So this mental attitude, this value, is what is behind the perishability of product. The reason I say that it, the perishability is not uh, a prohibitive factor is because there's nothing as perishable as labor. If you don't use labor right now, it perishes instantaneously. It's gone. You can't recover it, right? That's yes, right. Now, I don't know of an agricultural product in the abstract which is more perishable than labor. Yet labor, as perishable as it is, was indeed uh, sacrificed during the organization of labor unions in the United States for years by individuals in terms of an ideal. They were thinking of the dignity of the work situation in which they would operate and their share of the rewards for production. I think uh, agriculture will come to this. For instance, uh, you recently had a program where they had rat droppings in grain. Sometimes that gets so high the grain is contaminated and can be on, you, used for other than food purposes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't mind wasting it because, under those conditions because somehow or another it becomes legitimate uh, to waste it. So I think there's a moral value here in terms of the sinfulness of waste that is one of the bigger blocks rather than the question of perishability. And again, we rationalize. We say the perishability of product is the most important factor. Mm -hmm. Would you speak on uh, or substitutions of products or competition between products and <clears throat> how that might fit into this whole thought of collective bargaining for the good or the bad of society? Well, I, I think this is another argument that's very frequently used in agriculture about the substitutability of uh, one agricultural product for another and certainly the substitutability of, let's say, imported goods for uh, uh, domestic goods in agriculture. And indeed, it has some validity. There's no question about it. Substitu substitutability is very high. But as I pointed out before, there's great substitutability of capital for labor, too. Yet labor has been able to successfully organize in the face of a very efficient uh, substitution for labor. Uh, well, it limits. Uh, I think we should look at all of these factors as limiting factors, but not prohibitive factors. That is, making it impossible for collective bargaining to occur in agriculture. And I think, for that matter, these attitudes and values are changing. There's another thing, Ray, about the number of farmers and the diversity and the substitutability of product, which is not clear in the minds of many people in rural areas. And that is, um, we have, let's say, three and a half, 3.7 million uh, farmers in the nation. We have about 145,000 in the state of Minnesota. Of these, how many do you think produce, what percentage do you think produce about 80% of the total commercial saleable product in agriculture today? 20%? You knew the statistic before I asked. Well, That's true. <laughs> about 20%. One-fifth of the farmers produce about 80% of the product. And the fact of the matter is that uh, you don't have to organize 100% of them. You can organize 20% of them. And you can organize them by commodity groups as well as by the industry as a whole. So I think that uh, what is happening here is that uh, there is a changing attitude, a changing value as we begin to look at agriculture more directly to see what makes up agriculture 
why these conflicts, if they are there, do, uh, uh, why are they there, and what might be done about the diversity in the conflict which arises from the nature of the agricultural industry. I think that uh, right now there's a struggle for power. For instance, you might say that the NFO, as important as it has been in developing an attitude towards collective bargaining among farm groups, uh, it has also moved other farm groups, such as the Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau, as you know, recently uh, suggested uh, that they integrate and that uh, through some type of assessment of their membership or uh, membership dues, get enough funds together from their membership to purchase a controlling interest in the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, one of the largest supermarket retailers in the country. And by this combination of the retailing end as well as the production and possibly the processing end, there would be more control of the product and consequently the price of agricultural product. Uh, so you see that uh, the idea is becoming acceptable even to the Farm Bureau which uh, from a different approach perhaps but nevertheless acceptable that there has to be uh, some gather integration is really a form of developing resources so that you can develop power which is the basis of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. We hear this term vertical integration too would you clear that up and, and how it relates to collective bargaining is it the same is there a difference or which is what? Well, collective bargaining can be based upon vertical integration. It doesn't necessarily follow that you have to be vertically integrated. But vertical integration, let's say, does give you a uh, sort of a, an exclusive use of uh, a series of processes from production through retailing, let's say. Uh, and this, in turn, gives you more exclusive control over the production and distribution process which in turn leads to power, which in turn leads to bargaining power on the part of any group which happens to control these resources. You really need two or three things. You need organization, and vertical integration is a form of organization. You need numbers of people acting in concert with one another, and then you need resources, physical, financial, and human resources. And you get these three combined, the organization, the resources, and uh, you have the basis of power, mm -hmm. and you have the basis of collective bargaining. The unions have this in labor. Uh, agricultural cooperatives have bargaining power. Um, what they're proposing now is a further extension of the bargaining concept to involve producers' control over production and consequently over supply, in turn, over the return to agriculture for the product which agriculture provides to the market. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there's still a lot of sociological and psychological oh, hindrances or uh, retardants to progress in, in this area. People are still a little afraid of this. Uh, I suppose it goes back to this union thought that you talked about. What are the other factors that, that have a place here? A uh, part of it. I think uh, one of the big hindrances up until now of really uh, effectively considering collective bargaining has been that agriculture has had its power in a form of collective organization through political representation. Now that this form of representation is uh, being chipped away at, for instance, right now uh, this state is in a position of having to, uh, having a commission, uh, which you're aware of and I'm aware of that the governor has appointed to consider reapportionment. The courts have ordered that the legislature must reapportion again. And there's no question about the fact that uh, whatever the reapportionment is, there will be fewer rural representatives than there have been in the past, not only in this state, but in this nation as a whole. So some means of organization other than political organization and political representation becomes necessary to people in agriculture. That's why I think they are more seriously considering organization along an industry line or a commodity line, as has been true of labor so that their voice will be heard as a special interest group in the society. Uh, I think the real argument now is not whether or not collective bargaining is possible if people are honest with themselves. It's a question of how shall we achieve this collective bargaining. And there's also a struggle for power among the various farm organizations to see who will come out with the most power as a result of a reorganization of the agricultural sector of our economy. And of course, there are vested interests in the processing or the so-called output industries, and also in the input in industries associated with agriculture. 
So the struggle which is going on now is not an unusual struggle. It occurs uh, constantly in society among vested interest groups, and we can expect it to continue. But the fact that collective bargaining will grow, now I, don't, I, I purposely say will grow in agriculture rather than will come to agriculture is because it's already present mm -hmm. in cooperatives. It will grow in agriculture because we are a pluralistic society based upon vested interest group, each of which organizes itself so that it may be heard and uh, as a result of being heard present its case for a fair share of the rewards in our economy. Agriculture is looking for a fair share of its rewards. Uh, it may be getting a fair share now or it may not. Uh, apparently most of them in agriculture feel they are not. Therefore they tend to move in the direction of collective bargaining. How fast it moves I think depends a lot upon the, the economics of the situation. Are there are farmers making money? Are there pests or droughts or so on or uh, other uh, sources of, of food from other countries that might hurry up or advance action in this area of collective bargaining. Is this part of the, the picture? You've made an interesting point. You say it depends upon economic factors how rapidly collective bargaining will occur. I question very seriously whether or not uh, economic factors are the single most important factor. As a matter of fact, I would say these social psychological factors, the concept of rugged individualism, the concept of independence, the concept of freedom, which uh, rural people have in their mind. Not only the person on the farm, but also the person in the rural community who owns a business. And even the service worker who works in those businesses has these attitudes, which uh, to, th to them would be destroyed as a result of collective bargaining or concerted effort. In other words, uh, if you talk to a farmer today, he tells you that a man in the union is not free. He's not independent. Why does he say this, Ray? He says this because he feels that this man is subject to a larger force, that he's given up some of his sovereignty to the union, and as a result, he has to behave in accordance with these individuals. Little does he realize that the union individual may be far more independent of his uh, employer and far more independent of his union than the farmer is of the market and the forces of the so-called, quote, free market, unquote. Uh, see, his concept of independence is a uh, abstractly a different concept of independence, a different concept of freedom. Uh, the farmer has this rugged individualism which is associated with frontier type of development and property ownership. The laborer has a concept of independence and freedom which is based upon interdependence and upon abstract right of law. Therefore, you would find that real people's concepts were very appropriate to the development of our economy 100 years ago, but perhaps less appropriate in 1960. So these, this nostalgia, this carryover of tradition that's associated with rural life will have to undergo tremendous revision before we really uh, can have effective collective bargaining. Because as much as collective bargaining is made up of the three forces we spoke about before, organization, numbers, and resources, it is also made up uh, by a uh, mental state you see, the way people regard cooperation with one another and how they see the economic structure of the economy as a whole. This becomes exceedingly important. In other words, uh, do I see the economy uh, as a one where there is a group of individual entrepreneurs in the so-called uh, classical free enterprise system, or do I see the economy as a highly diversified, highly specialized, concentrated economy in which very few people, let's say, uh, are uh, self-employed and most are employed by others. You see, the farmer still has a concept of our economic system that was true maybe in 1850 or earlier, but not today. And therefore, there is sort of a selective perception. He wears a set of blinders when he looks at the economy. Uh, while farmers may object to this, and rural people generally may object to this, I would say that uh, they live in sort of a um, world of fantasy in part. Uh, at least sort of a, a world of their own. Uh, this is true of the independent merchant on Main Street in rural areas as much as, as it is true of the farmer. Uh, many of their mental images of society, their, concept of soci their concepts of society and its organization are outdated by, oh, at least 50 years, Ray. Now, you may object because you come from uh, rural heritage. Uh, would you agree or disagree with that? Maybe I could put you on the spot. 
want to state that question again? <laughs> I'd like to state that one again. Yes. No, I, I, I really think that in I find, for instance, uh, uh, in talking to people such as yourself, uh, not you in particular, mm -hmm. but people who have come from a rural heritage, uh, that really, even though they live, let's say, in the Twin Cities, in a metropolitan district, uh, the mental attitude they have is quite frequently associated with an agrarian economy rather than an industrialized agricultural economy. Uh, you would find attitudes uh, among professors at the university with this background, of uh, being uh, quite, uh, for instance, uh, associated with the traditional concepts of unionism and attitudes towards unionism, largely because of the conditioning they receive very early in life and the fact that they have never reconsidered the structure of society. This is not true of urbanites. Uh, I'll give you an illustration of this, Ray, in terms of collective bargaining. Many, many people thought that somehow or another, the absence of collective bargaining resulted in greater productivity per individual. Now, uh, why would this be true? Because they thought individuals were more responsible, more willing to work in the absence of collective bargaining. They'd heard about restrictive labor practices and so forth. But I think you'll have to remember that any society, and particularly rural society, has restrictive labor practices associated with it too. But they're not written down in a form of a contract that you can only put up so many bricks a day. You see, they're unconscious agreed to norms of production. For instance, uh, one time a 15 cow herd was an acceptable herd, and if you started to push towards 30 cows, what did people think of you? You were a real pusher, mm -hmm. weren't you? And what was this fellow trying to do, get rich? Was he trying to put pressure on the rest of us? Uh, now a 30 cow herd would be a small dairy herd. But at one time, that was the acceptable herd. And one time, you had to be a diversified farmer. Anybody who went, let's say, into uh, uh, specialized farming uh, was looked askance at, wasn't he? Uh, so I think that what we have is a set of norms that are unwritten, unconscious parts of uh, the mores of the rural community or the rules and regulations of the rural community uh, that tend to be codified and written down in urban society where they're explicit, where every individual can see them. And uh, while they're different from the norms in rural society, uh, the norms of the contract situation in unions are not unlike the norms of production in rural areas. George, it's been real interesting uh, visiting with, him, with you, hearing the story of collective bargaining, what it is, what it does, what it, what it might do. We want all of you to keep thinking about that topic, problem. If you'd like further information on it, we have some reading material. We have a sheet here, or several sheets, called Agricultural Bargaining Power which ties in, it's really the same as, we might say, collective bargaining, at least from the agricultural point of view. If you'd like to get this material, write to me. That's Ray Wolf, University of Minnesota, St. Paul 1. Ray Wolf, University of Minnesota, St. Paul 1. And ask for material on collective bargaining, and we'll send this along to you. Be thinking about this. If you don't agree with George, let him or me know. Thank you, George Donahue, Professor of Sociology, <coughs> for this discussion on collective bargaining. Till next time then, so long. Ray Wolf and his guests are brought to you by the university's Institute of Agriculture. Ray will be back at the same time next week with another program for Town and Country.